Center for Space Physics. He's over there. And then we have uh, Dr. Dr. Koichi Yotani yeah, from SIA, Academia Sinica Institute of for Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, we also have Dr. John Tomsik sitting over there. Over there? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> over there. Yeah, from uh, Space Sciences Lab, UC Berkeley. And we also have Dr. Yuan Feng from Shanghai Observatory. Okay, great. And uh, as you know, this is NCTS summer school. So this summer school is strongly supported by National Center for Theoretical Sciences. And now I'd like to invite the uh, director of the uh, physics division of NCTS, Professor Zhu Chongsang, to speak a few words. OK, let's welcome Director Zhu. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, a uh, warm welcome. Uh, thank you for to those uh, coming by the board for so when Chang Gong uh, talked to me about uh, the idea about uh, this school, I find this a very uh, timely and uh, important uh, of, uh, event to organize because uh, as we know, that is a very important subject in uh, radio physics. Uh, it has a very long history, but uh, it's actually uh, our understanding of black hole changed as our, just as our understanding of uh, gravity. So uh, currently, we have uh, Einstein theory of gravity, but it's just a uh, This uh, center of theoretical uh, sciences uh, has two divisions, as a math and a physics division. We are the physics division here. The math division uh, located is located in NTU in Taipei. Um, we occupy the fourth and fifth floor of this building. So when we have time this week, uh, please feel free to look around, and then uh, you may find other businesses uh, in this uh, building. Uh, we, we work on different areas of uh, physics, apart from astrophysics, astronomy, also uh, soft matter, biophysics, etc. Uh, we work with uh, physical physics. Surface Center, we are interested in collaboration with uh, international friends and uh, colleagues, and also we serve as a platform for to serve the community in Taiwan. Um, we have a body of about 25 postdocs and uh, tens of about 10, 15 scientists uh, resident. So that's about it. I hope you all enjoy this week and have a nice time. Thank you. By the way, there's some uh, information about the center. Please feel free to take one if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. So, uh, as you know, our, the background of our audience actually is very diverse. So, I have told our speakers to uh, speak slowly and also, uh, if possible, also even to cut the lecture shorter than our schedule time so that uh, we have more time for interaction, question and, question and answer and interaction and also to allow longer break time using our schedule. Our coffee break is only 20 minutes and I think that's a little too short, too short. Yeah. So the speakers may cut lecture yeah, shorter. And another technical point, for those who need financial support for partial financial support for your accommodation, please ask your hotel to issue the receipt uh, to type your name in the receipt instead of National Human University. Okay, your name, your name, exactly your name in the receipt. Okay, fine. So now we are two minutes in advance, but yeah, we can start, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's first welcome Professor Sandeep Chakrabarty. Uh, good morning everybody. So um, uh, I will be starting uh, from very basics because I, I, I assume that there are a lot, you know, there is a diversity. There are some undergraduates as well as some professors and faculty. So uh, 
Um, my talk will be in basic. It will start from very basic topics, although it's not working. Uh, uh, it will sometimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 it will be slightly less, uh, 100%, but okay. So the, and if you want to um, slow me down, if you want to stop me and ask uh, um, a question, you are most welcome. That, I mean, you can always ask question at any time. Because this is supposed to be school, and I like you all of you to be in phase with me, so that if they, they are to be to miss something, you better ask the question and clear it up. Because uh, once we go forward, we don't want to come back to the first lecture in the fifth lecture. Let's say so. The first thing that I want to start is uh, with the um, uh, with the simplest possible accretion flows that uh, this uh, you know, the subject started long time ago, um, <clears throat> 1950s. Uh, Bondi started the subject 1952. He wrote a famous paper. The matter is falling on radially onto a star, and then of course after that uh, there were rotating the flows which were purely rotating, like 1973, the 1980s. The flows are purely rotating. So there were flows people have been making models with a purely radial flow or purely rotating flow. So today we start from that those simple models, simple models, and then we um, go um, you know from there. Now there are two major classes. Uh, you know there could be three, there could be four. But for astrophysical purposes, we have stellar mass black holes. And um, generally we talk about the small mass black holes. Which are about three to uh, three plus to about twenty solar masses, and mainly from supernova core collapse, collapse or accretion induced, um, you know, merger of neutron stars, etc. These are the small black holes, which will be mostly the data that I will be discussing are from these black holes, or the heating, etc. And there are supermassive black holes, which are at the galactic center, or generally in the galactic center. And the, uh, so these are the two things. We, of course, uh, there are recent claims of intermediate mass black holes. I may talk a little bit about them. And also there are primordial black holes, people talk about them when they were formed in the early universe. So we will not talk about them. We will talk about only the stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes and possibly some examples of intermediate mass black holes. Now, the, when the matter is falling onto a black hole, as you know, all of you must have uh, you know that the uh, black holes cannot be seen. You know, this is a supposed to be everybody is, uh, knows uh, everybody knows that black hole cannot be seen. But then, why do we study them, and how do we study them? Uh, how do we see them? Okay, in reality, we don't see the black holes at all. We see the radiation that is fall, um, coming out from the matter that is falling onto a black hole. So matter is coming, let us say this is a very simple, um, uh, just an equation, you can easily see that, um, you can easily see that the, the, the matter coming from very far away at a distance r around a black hole m1 and this is a proton or any amount of any matter, let us say, this is the potential energy that it has and when the matter started coming towards the black hole, that potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy, okay, so this is normal. And then kinetic energy, there will be collisions, and this uh, will slowly become a thermal energy. They will get hotter and hotter, and then hotter and hotter radiation matter will start emitting radiation. So this is basically how the uh, energy is converted into radiation. So and this is the radiation that you see by satellites. So when matter is falling onto a black hole, you actually observe this, but the energy is coming from the potential energy of the matter. Okay. So this uh, black hole themselves cannot be seen, but the radiation which is you know coming from that matter can be seen. Then the question of course comes: Then how do you know that this radiation is coming from a matter which is falling onto a black hole and not on a neutron star or a star? Because I never said that this equation has anything to do with black hole. I only said that there is a potential energy which gets converted into radiation. And M1, there is no proof that M1 has to be a black hole. M1 could be anything, massive object. But the black hole, but uh, there is no guarantee that this has to be a black hole. But the reason why, um, you know, we, it is very high energy radiation can be obtained from a black hole is that for a given mass, radius is very small for the case of black holes. So this m by r ratio is extremely small for the smallest in the case of black holes. So we will get the highest possible radiation if it were a black hole. If it were not a black hole, it's a standard star or even a compact object, white dwarf, you will also see some radiation. 
and they would from this type of conversion, but the radiation will not be of that high energy. But this is not the only reason, you know, I am saying this is a lack of radiation, but I will quantify them as we go, go along. So rule of the thumb is that closer you go to the compact object, you get the flow will get hotter and hotter and the radiation will be harder and harder. Okay. And, and this R, generally we will measure in the entire school, entire next four or five talks or whatever I have, we will measure the distances in units of the radius of the black hole. Okay, 2 gm by c square. You can take as a homework, those of you who are younger, take a homework to try to find something of dimension length out of g, m and c. Okay, so you take g, m and c, try to create something having dimension length, and that length will come out to be 2 gm by, you know, gm by c square will have a dimension of length, and black hole radius will be 2 gm by c square, if it is not rotating. If it is extremely rotating, black hole will be smaller, and the size will be gm by c square. So this radius, just to give you an idea, that if the sun, if I take the sun, which is mass is about 2 into 10 to the power 33 grams, that mass, if you compactify and make it comp compress it and make within 3 kilometers, okay, then it will become a black hole. So the sun, radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometer. Radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometer. Diameter is 1,400,000 kilometer. It's a big size. You have to compress it in six kilometer size. Three kilometer radius, six kilometer diameter. It will become a black hole. So that tells you how compact the black hole is. For a given mass, you know, size is very small. We will come to that. We just started. Yeah, we just started. That's what I already discussed. That this is the general principle that coming to an any object, we will show exactly which radiation should be emitted when it is falling onto a black hole. Okay. So this is just the beginning. This is the general principle. Now, uh, astrophysics, this is a very old slide by Martin Reeves, but generally remains open, uh, the, the same even today. That how do you make black holes? Okay. How do you make black holes? There are but, you know, the, the, typically you start with a gas cloud, then the star formation will go through, you know, you can see the, follow this, uh, I will give you the talks, so you can also have them. And so you can, uh, you, you see the different channel, the, the collapse, collapse and attrition, you directly form a massive black hole, there's a star formation, then star cluster, and the new stars are formed, and all is, they, they will also, in different channels, you will be able to see that uh, different you know, small black holes and big black holes can form. This is a really complex system. You can see that the black holes which are larger than three solar masses are formed here, and they, they don't produce massive black holes. And the massive black holes are usually at the in the galaxy, directly like that, or merger of binary massive black holes, etc. Uh, so let us say two ten to the power seven solar masses can merge uh, in some time, and then you make a two into ten to the power seven solar mass, roughly speaking. So this kind of, this is a different channels to make black holes in astrophysical black holes. And we will be discussing only the astrophysical black holes, not the quantum black holes, like quantum mechanics also predicts lots of black holes which are given a, a size of an electron, let us say. We will not discuss about it. We will discuss about the black holes which are produced by astrophysical processes, like for, you know, gravitational collapse, or the binary merger, neutron, neutron star, neutron star merger, or accretion induced, a neutron star which forms a black hole, or supernova explosion, the pole collapse, so there are astrophysical processes which form black holes. We will talk about them only. Now, first, if I talk about the uh, massive black holes, suppose I talk about a very massive black hole in a galactic center, then these massive black holes, how do they get, how do they get matter so that we can see them? Okay, as I told you that in order to see black holes, I must have matter around them, we should be falling into them. Okay, so I have to see how the matter should be, could be supplied to the galactic center first, let us say. So in the galactic center, you, suppose you have a black hole, and there are n number of stars, and all these stars have wings, and this is an example of the star scalar, scalar wind interaction, and they, you know, there are some shock formation, etc. So these are the, these two stars, suppose there is a black hole sitting there, there are n number of stars around, and these stars, many of them will have wings, they will collide, they will, you know, they will cancel each other's angular momentum and uh, momentum along this direction, but along that direction, the, the angular momentum will be, uh, the radiation, so the, along this direction, the momentum will be cancelled, more or less, and along that direction, 
the matter will start flowing. And suppose there is a black hole sitting there, on an average, all the stars around them will have their transverse momentum cancelled, and only the radial momentum, roughly speaking, will be left over. So, a lot of matter will come, and they need not have very large angular momentum. Okay, so most of them will be pointing towards the black hole, and the black hole will be surrounded by more or less spherically symmetric matter, may have a small rotation. So, there are, there are also other ways that as people talk about, the like tidal reception. Okay, tidal reception is something that uh, when a star comes to a, close to a black hole, if it comes very close to a black hole, then the star can be, you know, broken into small pieces, and this, um, the black hole uh, will eat, up, eat that star. I think uh, there is a, well, there is a simulation here. I took it from the web. There is a, well, I don't know what is happening. Yeah, you can see that the star is getting torn apart if it has come close to the black hole, and that matter will enter into a black hole, massive black hole, okay? So massive black hole generally eats matter two ways. One is just from the stellar winds, from the large number of stars around it, they, the winds, um, they cancel each other's the moment, transverse momentum, but the radial momentum remains valid, remains non-zero, and that falls onto a star, supermassive black hole with a low angular momentum, or if a star comes very close <coughs> to the black hole, then the star may be torn apart into small pieces, and that gas will, start, will fall into a black hole, okay? So these, these are the two major, major ways that black hole can um, actually eat, okay? This is the, I think this is one of the, this is also an artist's rendition, that there is a black hole sitting there, okay? And you can see that the star passing by. This is an animation, this is not a real thing. Earlier one was a animation, but this is, you can see that the star is coming, but if it is within certain radius, it gets totally torn apart, and then it, it uh, started forming into a, uh, forming into a uh, accretion disk, we call it, and then it, the matter actually falls into a black hole after, so part of the matter goes out, and part of the matter falls into, uh, into the um, black hole. So what happened is that the star is coming into its trajectory, so the center of mass will continue to move within the trajectory, but half of the matter will fall into a black hole, half of the matter will go out, but the center of gravity will still follow the old type. So that is the precise, that is one of the reasons why it was, you saw that some matter actually escaped and some matter fell into the black hole. This is an artist's rendition, but this is sufficiently um, realistic. Now, I will uh, go to a, a very important topic, which really now we are getting into the uh, science part, okay? Science part is, the first question I want to ask you that how do, that when the star is tidally disrupted, first of all I want to ask you what is a tidal force? Does anybody do everybody I mean know that they, what a tidal force is? For example, if I drop this pen this way or that way, will there be any difference? Do you have any idea? Tidal force is an interesting force. Many of you do not know the, uh, uh, you know, why tidal force occurs and why there are tides, tides in the sea. Yes, I believe they do know. They know? They know. No, no, but I, I want to hear from them. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to point to, uh, with, the, with the eyeglass you, for instance. Just tell me what is the tidal force. Tidal force, have you heard of tidal force? No? Tidal force, what is it? Uh, tidal force, uh, when <coughs> you come close to, closer to a massive object, okay. the, uh, if, your, if your pen, yes. uh, your pen the, the top one is uh, farther than... Beautiful. Uh, so he already knows. <laughs> he, knows <laughs> he knows that, that if, it is, if, if the pen is falling like that, this part will be pulled much stronger than this, this part. And therefore, the, the pain will be disrupt, you know, will be, will be pulled apart. Like if I fall onto a black hole, my feet will be pulled much stronger than the head, so I will be pulled into a, a small, you know, a, like a fiber, okay, optical fiber. So this, this, this is the tide. tidal force is not gravity, but it's a differential gravity. Gravity between this point and that point, okay. Differential force that, that extends the object. Now, if I drop it like that, 
then there will be no tidal force because basically it's a, a one dimensional object. So this tidal force is responsible to tear the stars apart. And uh, let us try to understand under what circumstances not everybody is getting tidal in this topic. You know, I am, our star, Earth is moving around the sun, but it is not tidally disrupted. So obviously there, there's a limit, uh, there's a, close, a limit by which you should come that much close so that that uh, object will be destroyed, okay, tidally disrupted. So let me very quickly tell you that what is the condition. So there is a star sitting there, there is a complex object sitting there, and their the distance is about D, okay. And this object has a near, near end and there is a far end, and so the gravity will be different. So if you want to take the differential gravity, so you find out the on an average, this is the gravity on the center, and this is gravity at the far end, and this is the difference of gravity between the center and the far end. Okay. And um, similarly, there is an angular velocity also, so the centrifugal force on the outer side is also larger compared to the center. So centrifugal gravity, centrifugal force is also trying to uh, put, you know, trying to break the object, and the gravity, you know, also is trying to uh, have a stretch the object. So this kind of stretching, both of them are trying to destroy the object. So the one force is due to gravity, differential gravity, two gm mr by dq, and due to centrifugal force, gm by d square. Both of them, uh, sorry, yeah, both of them are actually trying to force the object. Uh, so the, the omega square. Okay. Now if you add them up. And that is the, the total amount of force that is trying to destroy the object is going to be is at all 2 gmmr, sorry, gmmr by pq. So this is the force that is going to try to destroy the star. And all you have to do, this is the total amount of force, gravity and centrifugal. So the one is 2 gm error by dq, one is gm error by dq. You add them up, and this is this, this is the total amount of net force which is going to destroy the star, and that should at least balance the self gravity of the star. Gravity is trying to make it, you know, identity, otherwise it will not be having an identity, okay? So star is trying to pull itself due to gravity, that is pulling itself is gm m by r squared, and that is going to be trying, people are, I mean, forces are trying to destroy it by this force, so the, at least, you know, star should be sufficiently strong to be able to balance it, okay? Then you don't destroy it. So if you put them together, you find that the d minimum is this okay? So at least one star should be close to the other star, at least this close, okay? So that it will be tidally disrupted. So it is not that anybody passing through it. Very recently, yesterday, we have read a newspaper, very good news has come that due to tidal force, not only star gets destroyed, but the star gets also, um, you know, collapsed in the center and a lot of nuclear reactions take place during that process. Even a white dwarf started reigniting. Just yesterday's news, I was. Um, uh, reading, it was very serious. In fact, uh, one of my um, visiting students also is a co-author of that. It is in color now. So the, this is the situation that if you are far away, if you are passing through the black hole from far away, then the star will be a little bit deformed, but it will come back to its. The star will re, you know reform again into a single star. But if you are coming closer and closer, you can see that the star is getting disrupted. This is a very old simulation, but that gives you the idea. Okay, that is a real uh, you know, simulation of the numerical simulation. So that tells you that yes, this is how the matter could be supplied to a black hole. Now, if you look at our Milky Way the, in a good night sky, you will see actually large number of our galaxy, large number of X-ray sources are there. And out of them, we know that there is a galactic center has a black hole, about, about uh, 4 million solar mass. And, and there are other uh, um, small, you know, stars, small black hole candidates throughout our galaxy. Okay, and many of, many of them are neutron star candidates. These are the X-ray sources, so they could be neutron star candidates as well. Okay, so now we, this is one thing that um, I wanted to discuss, that how common they are. So far, one thing I discussed that about the, how the matter could be supplied to a galactic center, and then I am trying to say that why binary systems can also produce, uh, you know, can have black holes and how many of them we should expect. One thing you should know that if you see an open, if you see in a clear sky, 60% of the stars that you see are actually in binary systems, okay? So this is a very serious thing. If you are see all of them, you see them mostly single, but in reality with a small telescope, even with a four inch telescope, you see them binary. Now, when they are formed, it is not necessary that they form with the same mass. 
one is always a little bit more than the other. And if the mass is larger, it will evolve faster because its temperature at the center will be larger, and therefore the nuclear reactions will be much faster, etc. And then, then chances are that this bigger mass object will ultimately have a supernova explosion, or it will become a white dwarf, or a neutron star, or a black hole. And the other object will sustain for a long time. So if the mass is smaller, they sustain for a long time. Like Sun, for example, its age is about 4.6 billion years, and it has sufficient hydrogen to stay for another 5 billion years. So Sun is not going to die very soon. It is a very low mass star. But if the mass is larger, let us say 10, 20, 30 solar masses, they, they can evolve very rapidly. There will be supernova explosion, and at the same time, whatever is left over could be a neutron star or a black hole, if a smaller object goes out, it could be a white dwarf. So this is stellar evolution, I am not going into detail. But the point I am trying to make is that in the stars that you see, even in our gal galaxy, most of them are binaries, and they are not necessarily equal mass. One is more massive than the other, and one will be evolving faster, and therefore you end up having one compact object and, and one normal object going around. So many objects that you see, you should expect that one of them will be a black hole or an star or a white dwarf. Either they are already there or they will be become very soon. And the other one is a normal star. And so this this is uh, so therefore we are expecting one solid supermassive black hole at the galactic center that we said that during the uh, star the collapse of the beginning of the at the evolution of the galaxy and the others are evolving and forming uh, etc. throughout this lifetime of the galaxy. So although there are all types of stars, all types of stars which you may already know, but there are the white dwarfs also sitting here, and then during the evolution, you, you will see that some of them will, have, will go into black holes or neutron stars, and there will be red giants also moving around. Okay, And these stars are big, and therefore you can tidally disrupt it also, tidally pull the matter, and then that matter will enter into a black hole. So when you have a binary system of two normal stars, very nice. But if you don't see the secondary by an ordinary telescope, don't imagine that the secondary is not there. Secondary may be there, but it may not be emitting optical light, so you don't your telescope will not see it for inch telescope. It may see only this one. Okay? So you see a Cygnus X1, for example, you take a telescope, see the Cygnus X1 object, you may not be able to see this at all in a small telescope. You will see only this one because it is not emitting optical. So this maybe a black hole or a neutron star or a white dwarf. And this uh, gravity is so strong that, and it is pulling the matter, but it is not destroying the thing. Okay. In the case of central black hole, it is destroying the star and eating up the whole thing, at least half of it. Here, it is pulling the star little by little and this matter has some angular momentum, so it will go round and round and round and enters into the black hole. So this going round and round and round and entering into a black hole, that, that reservoir Disc. So this is an accretion disk, this is a temporary reservoir, matter is being supplied from outside and matter is getting eaten up from inside, <coughs> getting entering into black hole from inside. So this temporary reservoir is very important and this reservoir emits, you know, outer rays may be emitting very low energy X-ray and then as you go in, it may be emitting very high energy gamma rays. So this radiation will have some characteristics and from the satellite data, we should be able to fit and try to understand what is the central object? Is it a neutron star or a black hole or a white dwarf? Or and uh, what is the, the from the radiation you should be able to understand everything about the black about the black hole or a neutron star? What is the mass of it? Okay, etc. So this radiation from this disk is very important for us for the observers. Okay, so and this is a typical. So this is also a tidal tidal process, but it is not disrupting the companion. Do you have any questions so far? So both the cases, tidal force is important. In the case of supermassive black hole, tidal force disturbs the uh, nearby stars generally or can also act from the winds. Here also, you can have tidal forces taken or it can also act from the winds if the star has a lot of winds. Okay, I'll come to that. So in both the cases, you can have attrition directly from the star or you can have attrition from the winds of the star. Okay, so um, I'll come to this. Now in any case, when the matter is coming here, this is as you know that this is a Keplerian orbit. You already know that what a, what a Kepler's law is. Where the Kepler's law is the uh, law in where you know, gravity balances the centrifugal force. 
So the man, when the companion rotates around the center of mass, uh, this this usually it for t square by a to a cube rule. So that is how the matter actually rotates. It has an angular momentum which is proportional to the square root of the distance. So this uh, so this disk is also supposed to have angular momentum, and that angular momentum has to be gradually lost in order that the matter can fall into the black hole. Okay, so you cannot have a large angular momentum and it, it will never fall. Like sun and earth, earth is never falling into the sun because earth is not losing angular momentum. Even Saturn's ring, you may have seen Saturn's ring by a telescope. You see lots of rings are there, all of them are moving in Kepler's orbit. Okay, and they are not colliding very much and therefore ring is not evolving very much. It is evolving but very slowly. So, and there are some moons to take away the, take care of the angular momentum transport. So these kind of systems, which are not colliding at all, will not evolve very fast, okay? Because the matter has large angular momentum, they will just go round and round. Similar things will happen here. If there are not much viscosity, not much collision, then the system is not going to evolve into and form a huge disk. You need to take away the angular momentum in order that matter falls into the black hole. Now this is how the angular momentum actually distribution looks like. Okay, you, you equate the gravity, 1 over r square. So basically, a 1 over r square is this uh, gravitational force, and you equate the centrifugal force, h square by r cube. Okay, this is the angular momentum of the object, uh, companion, h square by r cube is the, is the centrifugal force, and this is the gravitational force. Okay, so this, if you balance it, if you balance it, then it becomes a Keplerian angular momentum, and then a Keplerian angular momentum goes like square root of r. Okay, so that is the square root of r around a Newtonian object. So if there is a Newtonian star, if there is no general relativity, so then this is the rule. Okay, general relativity GTR will change this force term. Okay, and because it makes it make it will make it much more much more complicated. It is not to only have the square term; it will also have cube to the power four to the power five, etc. So that makes it more complicated. Maybe I will spend some time on that. It is necessary to understand this to see the, what is the difference between a Newtonian space-time, uh, you know, behavior of matter around a Newtonian uh, star and behavior of matter around a black hole. This is very important uh, difference. As you can see here already, that in a Newtonian object, around a Newtonian object, this is what you have read in the school. This is the Kepler's law. Lambda goes like, lambda means uh, angular momentum goes like square root of r. Everybody knows t square is proportional to a cube, and that boils down to saying angular momentum goes like r to the power half. Okay, this is what you have read in the school. But in general relativity, if you say around the black hole, this uh, this rule does not work. The, around the black hole, actually, angular Keplerian distribution looks like this. Okay, because the formula is a little bit different. Not only it is r to the power half, but it is divided by one minus two by r. So one minus two by r that comes from the metric in the Schwarzschild geometry. Okay, so the, this is how the, the you know people measure the distance. Um, uh, in the GTR, I, I don't know how many of you have learned the GTR, but I can uh, make a simplified version. I can use a pseudo Newtonian term potential. So, in, what you all you have to do, all you have to do is to. I think you, all of you take a homework, very simple homework, very easy. Just choose this instead of r square, just choose r minus two square for the sake of simplicity. And here I have chosen g m um, equal to c equal to 1. Again, just to, so that I don't have to write again and again, okay? So instead of 1 over r square, if you just choose 1 by r minus 2 whole square, and then equate to 2 is this, uh, you know, remember, 2 gm by c square is the size of the black hole. So just change the, see the origin from the center to horizon, and then you have the centrifugal force behaves like this, very close to general relativity. This is exactly how it behaves, roughly speaking, and this is the centrifugal force. Just equate them and you will get that distribution, general relativistic distribution. So you should try to use this, calculate the angular momentum from that, and then you should also try to calculate the other properties. Where is this, for instance, for instance, you would like to know where is this minimum, at what distance from the black hole this minimum takes place. What is the angular momentum uh, here, okay? It is very important, this is the fundamental thing of accretion disk. Although this is a particle dynamics, but extremely fundamental to understand the uh, matter falling into a black hole. 
Okay, I'll come to this slowly, but try to remember this picture. At least you keep it drawn on your card, so that you again and again you come to this picture. Because this is a, although this is a particle dynamics, fluid will doesn't have to follow this exactly this. Fluid dynamics will have its own forces like pressure, and you can have other forces, inertial force, ramp pressure, but this is fundamental for particle dynamics. Now, <clears throat> the other thing we have to know is as somebody pointed out, how do you know matter is falling onto a black hole? I'm going back and forth because I, I'm just putting exactly that amount of theory which is I need uh, uh, you know, the next slide. And then we go to another, again some theory, again some observation. So now that you know that Kepler's law is valid actually everywhere, I like to tell you how to measure the mass of a black hole using Kepler's law. Everybody knows that we can measure the mass of a sun by watching a planet. Okay, I see the velocity at which the planet is moving, I know the distance from the sun and the planet, I apply the Kepler's law. Similarly, if I see a, if I see matter is going around a, this is velocity, Kepler's velocity, and if I see a star, okay, companion, going around a suspected black hole, you don't even know if it is a black hole or not, this object is going away from you, this object is coming towards you, so there will be Doppler shift. Many of you know about the Doppler shift. So any emission, any line emission that is being emitted, that emission will have a, you know, this will be uh, red shifted, this will be blue shifted. Okay. So that is one of the ways to, again, the, just to apply the Kepler's law immediately, I will show you that you take this velocity and you put it as a Kepler's velocity. And then V by C, this is the velocity of light, that will cause Doppler shift. Delta nu by nu. So from so in observationally, you see the Doppler shift of some line emission, delta nu, and at a given nu. So delta nu by nu and V5, you already know because you are measuring the uh, Doppler shift, delta nu by nu. So V5 you already know, you equate it with the Kepler's law. We already told you what LK is, so you can calculate the velocity. Vk is same as L sub k by r, square, it goes like square root of 1 over r. So Vk plus n or V5 really goes like 1 over r. So I am telling you, this is exactly V5, that V is nothing but this, this um, you know, formula. You have to put 2gm by c square. And so there, and then of course there you see in front to give the dimension of velocity. So this is a way Somebody pointed out that how do you know there is a black hole? You just calculate this and measure the mass of the central object. Because nobody stops you from measuring. This is the mass that you get, and that directly from the observation. And if this mass is very large, you know it is a black hole. How large is large? If it is larger than three times the mass of the sun, in the case of small objects, or if it is very large, like few million solar mass, it is a black hole. Okay. So that's a very simple way. Also, there you are not talking about the accretion, radiation from accretion, but there you are talking of the companions, just starting the companion. Okay, in case there is no uh, mass exchange, you can still measure the mass of the central object. I will give you an example here, for example, m 7 is a black hole, supposed to be a massive black hole. If you measure the same line, let us say oxygen, some line, on this side and that side of the black hole, one will be blue shifted, one will be red shifted. This is observed, this is by Hubble telescope, it was observed 1994. Okay, so this directly gives you, you see the same line is red shifted and blue shifted. So from there you know delta nu by nu, and from there you know the, you put the um, velocity as k plus law, you immediately get the mass to be about 2 billion solar mass. Once something is within the compact distance, once there is 2 billion solar mass sitting there, you know it's a black hole. So there is no mass exchange going on, but still from the, from the motion of the uh, matter, from the velocity of the motion of matter, applying Kepler's law, assuming Kepler's law is valid, because as I said, Kepler's law need not be valid everywhere. It is valid only for particle dynamics. But for fluid dynamics, Kepler's law is different. But assume that it is roughly speaking the same. Okay? So even if it is 10% plus minus, you would not worry, because the mass is very large, 2 billion, it will not become, uh, it will not change much. Okay? Even if the Kepler's law is not valid. But applying Kepler's law blindly, you get a mass of about 2 billion solar mass. Today we know that the mass is at least 4 billion solar mass, because it is not Keplerian. 
Okay, because there are uh, more better calculation, you can calculate it, but it is about 4 million solar mass. Okay, so this is another way, this is to actually study black holes, not only for accretion, but only just to study the rotation. The other concept that I, so this is, the, this is a Kepler's uh, orbit, how to use the Kepler's law to find the mass. I want to talk, talk to you about another concept which you always use when the mass is actually exchanging. The earlier case, mass was not exchanging, it was just going around. Now we want to talk about the system where the mass is actually being exchanged from one star to the other due to tidal force, okay? We call it a Rosslow overflow. This is a very important concept. Okay, Rosslow overflow, you must have heard 20 times or 100 times and you will, in the rest of your life, you will be talking about it for few, several thousand times. This is something that, you know, people have to know. This Rosslow overflow can be calculated very easily, okay? With the, what is the meaning of Rosslow overflow? Let me first give you the picture, then you realize what Rosslow overflow, Rosslow, I mean, Rosslow overflow is. There is one star sitting here, and the one star sitting here, both of them, the, both of them, the, both of them, the potential is negative very much, okay? Individual potential. But since one star is going around the other, Okay, there is a common in common potential. So you take the you take the uh, effective potential around both of them. You find that the effective potential is with a cut. Effective potential looks like this in the equatorial plane, and there are some equipotential surfaces which cover both the both the stars. There is one equipotential surface which which is actually a crossing like a figure of eight. Okay, that potential surface that the, this this potential surface, this particular point, okay, try to remember this, is written A1, Lagrange point, okay? Just wanted to give you the first the answer so that you, you don't have, uh, you know, then I'll tell you the exactly how to create this picture because that is also an exercise you can do. So these two stars are trying to exchange matter and this exchange is possible only if the potential matter from this star crosses this, pot this barrier comes here and then goes on to the other star. Okay. So there could be three conditions, three situations, where both the stars are sitting there. They are not exchanging anything. They are very far away. And the matter, both of them is expanding but not crossing this part. So they are all totally detached by it. They are not exchanging anything. You check the uh, by today in four inch telescope, you will see many such binaries. They are not exchanging any matter. Okay. They are all individually, they are not even tidally very much distorted. Then there is a, if one of the star is giant and it may have actually extended and filled the fill this equipotential surface, the other one may not be receptive. Okay, this is called semi-detached surface, uh, semi-detached binary, and there is a contact binary where there is an over overflow matter actually overflows the Rosh law, red one you can see, and it goes to the other star a, as a accreting onto the system, and this accretion takes place from this from this local minimum of this of, of the potential, which is nothing but the figure of eight, that crossing point. So this is the, uh, so when there is a binary system, binary system, you may or may not be able to exchange matter. But if you do, then the exchange will take place through L1, okay? Provided, so this star is, is you know, popped up, filled up the Rosh lobe, this is called Rosh lobe, this is this, you know, this equipotential surface, and it enters into the Rosh lobe of the other star, second star, okay? And then it will act it onto this star. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, way how a binary system, uh, how a compact object gets matter from the companion, and it, it you know, when it is, there is a, this kind of contact binaries. Now let me come back to the way that we derive it, because you, you need to derive it yourself at one point of time. So there are two stars, one and two, and this is a common uh, you know, center of mass, and they are rotating around, so you go to the co-rotating frame, you take any point here, which is, it has an effective potential gm by s1, minus gm by, minus gm2 by s2, minus gm1 by s1, minus gm2 by s2, this is the potential at that place, gravitational potential, the sum total of the gravitational potential from these two stars, and you also add the fact that they are all rotating. So you want to plot a picture in the co-rotating frame, okay? Otherwise, that you know the whole thing will go on rotating. So you go into the co-rotating frame, which is rotating into the with the Keplerian orbit. So this is the centrifugal term, half omega square v square. Omega is the rotational velocity, you know, omega 
area, 2 pi by t, t is the time period. So that will be the effective potential, the gravitational potential plus centrifugal component. Okay? And this is the omega that I mentioned, which is k plus uh, omega. Okay, so this binary, you go to the rotating frame and you find the effective potential, just draw it. So I would request you, if you have some time after the classes, then you try to draw it if you were using a surfer or some kind of routine, just to try to find out how the equipotential surfaces look like. Okay, when there are two stars. If there is one star, equipotential surfaces are spherical symmetry, as you know. And there is also another interesting thing you know that gradient of potential minus of gradient of potential is a force. So if you like this surface, is potential is constant. So there is no force along that surface. But from that surface to this surface, potential is different. Gradient of potential is non-zero, and so there is the force is uh, in this side, and there is something if I do it here, it will be it will drop to here. So there is a gradient of potential will give a force, but if the potential is constant, there is no force. Okay. Similarly here, it is very good to know the equipotential surface because we need to know on what surface matter will not move along the potential. Okay, look at this potential. This is the these are the equipotential surfaces. You will get it if you have a surfer routine or something. Just plot what I just drawn. I gave it to you. And these are the equipotential surface. Why it is important? This tells you that if there are two bodies of matter sitting on the equipotential surface. They will, they, this matter will not move along that equipotential surface because there is no force. The force will be there only if the equipotential surface is in force. Okay, gradient of potential will be the force, minus sign. So this star has to pop up and there is a gradient of potential on this side, force will, matter will move in, and then again matter will start moving in, losing angular momentum gradually, and then you will get the accretion. Okay. So equipotential surfaces are good to know. In fact, when you go to moon or Mars, these are, these are, this is the place where you actually want to maneuver. When people themselves fly a spaceship, they are very careful to pass through this L1. Okay. If you make a small mistake, why L1 is important? It's very sensitive. Many of you know about the null, null experiments in the laboratory. When we go to the null point, and then we try to do the experiment because the, the, the deflection is highest there. So null point here, lambda, this L1 is the null point. Okay. If you make a small mistake, the object will not fall onto the moon, it will deflate, or it will not go into the moon. It will not go into Mars. It will either crash onto Mars in the wrong or or orbit, or it will just fly away. It will never come back again. So that is one of the reasons, as you know, that many of the countries try to send something to Mars, unmanned, because they are all unmanned, and most of them, 60 or 70 percent of them, could not even land on the Mars. Why? Because they, they could not pass through the L1. But if you are manned, like moon mission, lunar mission, generally manned, then you know exactly that how to manipulate the system to pass to L1. Okay. L1 is very important place, and I would say that you try to learn it because any accretion process will pass through that point, and uh, we, uh, you know, this, called, this is called raw slow overflow. So this raw slow, this raw slow has has now overflown and entered into the regime of the other star. So we call it a raw slow overflow. Okay. So this is an important concept, as you can see, the raw flow workflow matter entering into it and starting form, start to form an accretion disk. We call it in the reservoir I was telling you. So you supply matter from this side, and then it, it is eaten up by the black hole at the center. It is a continuous process. And this rate at which the matter is being supplied is called accretion rate. Okay, few grams per second. I will tell you how many grams generally happen for a black hole, but this is in grams per second. So matter is falling. And you know, generally you know the mass of a star, right? The mass of a star is about, let's say, sun is 2 into 10 to the power 33 grams. Okay. Now you cannot, you cannot take a lot of matter, then sun will remain uh, non-existent. But again, uh, the, typically, the, this kind of system, mass comes around 10 to the power 17 grams per second. Okay. 10 to the power 17, 10 to the power 18 grams per second. So this is sufficiently small number and enough to keep the star from pumping in. You know, really not depleted very rapidly. Okay, so I'll come to that. Only good thing, only thing that I have, come, I have, I want to introduce something interesting here, that that again try to understand that Kepler's law is valid for particle dynamics. And when you are discussing a fluid dynamics, Ross law of overflow. Okay, you should not think that they are strictly sitting on their in their orbit. 
because they're colliding, they are fluid. And once they collide, they are no longer pure Keplerian, they are hot Keplerian, what we call. Okay. This is like if you want to see the moon from the, let us say, well, a satellite around the moon from the earth, you see that sometimes the satellite is going in the opposite direction. You, we also see many planets which are going in retrograde motion. Okay. This is the this is the this is called epicyclic motion. Okay. This epicyclic motion on the top of cycles is a very important concept. If it is a Keplerian, pure Keplerian, it will have circular orbit. But if it's a hot gas, that hot gas will have an on an average some deviation from the Keplerian orbit, and that deviation we call epicycles will cause and that epicycles of that orbit and epicycles of that orbit, they will now collide and they will dissipate angular momentum. So if there's a hot Keplerian gas, they will collide and dissipate angular momentum. Okay. So the disk will no longer remain at the in, remain in the same orbit, the, that flow. Okay. There is a dissipation of angular momentum because the flow is a little bit is hotter than hotter than I will tell you the another concept. That suppose, let me draw it very a messy picture. If it is a Keplerian orbit, it will be like this particle orbit. But if it is a fluid, it is not only going doing this on an average, but it is doing like that. Okay, it is doing like that because it is a hot. It is doing Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. It has it has Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of velocity. It's a fluid fluid in one gram of fluid. You take it's a gas, and that gas is doing on an average doing like this, and then but. On an average, it is not going around. I don't know, I mean, I'm not uh, saying that it is not going around. But it is also having another velocity, thermal velocity. Okay, this is a random jittering motion. There's a bulk motion. On an average, it is going Keplerian, but there is a thermal motion, okay? This thermal motion allows the other orbit which is doing this to collide. So that allows you that the particle, if you are sitting in its own orbit, it will not collide to the next one. But if this gas is hot, it is doing like that while on the way, then it is going to collide with the other orbit, and that is going to diffuse angular momentum, and matter will start coming in. With a very low angular momentum, matter you cannot still produce, even if you send Keplerian this. So you send Keplerian matter, but they can collide and produce low angular momentum matter for you. Okay. Very low angular momentum sub Keplerian matter for you. It is possible because of the fact that the gas is very hot. This is like, like this simplest or the example that I gave. This was epicyclic motions. Okay, it's very useful. So don't take that people take it very seriously. Oh, it is a Keplerian this. So uh, you, you cannot have a low, low angular momentum. That is not true. They because of the fact that they are hot, they will collide with the nearby orbits. Just like I, I, I mentioned here. Hotter the gas is, the chances of collision is higher. Chances of lower angular momentum matter production is also higher. So this is a, a realistic system, rather than a Saturn's ring, for example. Saturn's ring, they are not colliding very much. In fact, they are colliding about once per orbit, if you calculate it. If you see the data of Voyager, if you see the Cassini's observation, even in Saturn's ring, they collide once per orbit. That is good enough to give some amount of viscosity. Separate issue, I am not going into that. That's very good science going on, Saturn's ring. But the same concept is a little more amplified when you consider this kind of rock flow of Although they are Keplerian matter falling in, but they are not particles. They have the pressure, they are hot, they are colliding uh, gases in the nearby orbits. So that is one kind of accretion. Everybody agrees with that. The other kind of accretion is that when the star, the companion, is having a huge amount of mass loss. Okay? So there is loss flow overflow I already mentioned. And I also said that during that process, angular momentum could be dissipated because the gas, they are all there hot. So you don't need to have a large viscosity or so to remove that angular momentum. They will remove it anyway because of the fact that they are colliding due to the heating uh, temperature. The stellar, the other is the wind accretion. If this is a star, huge amount of winds are coming out. And that wind overwhelms the system. And there is a small black hole sitting there. So black hole is sitting, that is the companion, is not eating through uh, uh, rock because the star is, is pretty big, it is not getting disrupted very much by this uh, air, but it is much, much more massive compared to the black hole. Okay. So this sometimes may be 10, 20 solar masses. So they take maybe huge amount of winds coming out, 
that means we will create and we come into the start uh, from a Lagrange point, let us say the other Lagrange point, this one, okay, A2. You can see that there is another Lagrange point from here. So Rosslov overflow goes through L1, your uh, winds will enter through, the, uh, through L2, okay. So these, these are the local minimum with uh, potential surfaces, uh, I mean effective with potential surfaces. So there could be two different ways, even in a stellar mass black hole system, matter can be in, can enter into black hole. So this is the, this is the most basic things I think you should know before we go into the theoretical part. Theoretical I have not even started. Era of radial and rotation, remember? That was our title. But so far I am just telling you the most basic thing, how the matter comes in the first place. Okay. So there could be two different ways, only Rosslow overflow, one is due to winds, and Rosslow overflow can also have diffusion and low angular momentum matter, and winds also have a low angular momentum anyway. Because imagine this. Why I'm saying this low angular momentum, how do you know? Because there is a start and there is a wind coming out. Okay? This wind is passing through the origin. So this this start, this wind has a zero angular momentum with respect to the origin, because it is passing through the origin. Okay. Angular momentum definition depends on the origin. Okay? V plus R. And V and R are parallel vectors. So these wings have zero angular momentum with respect to the center. These, and there is a small stupid black hole sitting there. Okay? So these fellows will be angular momentum will be generally very low. It's not a Keplerian huge amount of angular momentum. So when somebody is accreting wings, the angular momentum fate is already very low. And uh, so there are two issues. Let me summarize a little bit so far. For supermassive black holes, matter that activated from winds, low angular momentum, or matter that tidally disrupted would be a little bit higher angular momentum, but there's four radical Okay. For small mass black holes, stellar mass black holes, again there are two ways. One is Rosslow overflow, where angular momentum fade is Keplerian, but they're generally hot because they're colliding there, making it very hot. X-rays are coming out even at the outer edge. And then they are hot, so up to certain extent they go, but they may not be able to go further because the viscosity is not high. I will come to that physical process how matter actually enters. But then there will be low angular momentum will be always produced because of the uh, collision of the hot gas. The second process is if the companion already sends winds, and that wind is getting applicated like that. Okay. So there are two processes in both the cases. And we like to quantify all these motions and try to understand what kind of radiation it should come out and how how one should go about it. Now, while I am about it, I will also give you another concept. These are the basic things I must be first talk. So I must talk about the simple things that you must know. This is called Eddington rate. Okay. As I, I you know, half an hour back I told you that at what rate matter actually falls onto a black hole. What is the typical rate? How many grams per second? So Eddington a long time ago thought about it, that how to have an estimate of this mass, okay? Imagine, so I already told you, again, that the gas is getting hotter and hotter, and how many, do many of you know what is the ionization potential? Suppose you are sending hydrogen, and it takes about 11,000 degrees or so just to knock out the electron. If the gas is sufficient hot, the proton and the electron should be separate, okay? On an average, it is neutral, but uh, they, they will be separate. Now, it is hot. So this proton and electron, imagine both of them are falling onto a star. <coughs> Many of them. I have just concentrated, I am concentrating on a single system, just a pro proton and electron, this, this combination. This was a hydrogen atom very far away, then they have split it because it is a hot. Okay? Now gravity will pull the proton because proton is 2, 000, about 2,000 times more massive compared to electrons, and electrons have la la large mobility. They are not necessarily going around its own proton. They are all free, they are moving around of different protons also, but on an average each proton has one electron. Because total number of protons are the same as total number of electrons, so globally it is neutral, provided there is no pair production. If there are pair productions, you can, produce, you can also have electrons and positrons when the temperature is very high. I will not come to that right now. Right now, let us concentrate on the matter which is having proton and electron equal number, overall neutral, proton is getting pulled by the gravity, and this matter as they lose, it is losing the potential energy emitting radiation. And that radiation is now going back to electron and hitting the electron to go out. Okay. Because photons interact with electrons much better. Because electrons, if you consider the size, uh, cross-section wise, 
much much big, bigger the quantum wavelength in this particular case we call it quantum scattering okay so the electron electrons will be hit by the photons so photons see the electrons they deposit the momentum on electrons try to push them out of the star so on the one hand the star is trying to pull the proton and on the other hand the photon is trying to push the electron out so there is a fighting going on okay fighting going on and we just have to find out what are the forces acting operating operating on this operating on the system so that as a whole whether they are going to be active or whether they will run away okay and that will give you a limit how much matter can possibly come so that these two are I, these two forces are equal okay so one force i have already told you proton is pulled by this you know this, this is the rho is the total number density of proton so this is force density g m rho by r square and rho is the proton number density number density of proton number density of mass of proton this is the density of protons and why did i say number density of proton is same as number density of electron because it is generally electrically neutral and we are we are not concentrate we are not discussing proton pair productions so number of electron then in e is same as in okay so this is the force density of matter which is falling on a star simple but then we have this in in e number of electrons coming in and the star is emitting photons you divide by 4 pi r square at a distance r you get the photon flux that is coming out and then this is the reaction this is the interaction cross section sigma sub p by which the electron and the photon what is the probability that the photon is going to hit the electron etc so in this is the total number of scattering per electron will be n e gamma this is sigma t into n gamma where n gamma is the number density of photons so and this is the, this is nothing but just square of r okay you can see that this is like the number 26 or so 24 this is about uh, q per square so this is the um, electrons basically the cross section to twice the radius into whole square so this is the sigma t cross section and this is the number of scattering taking place per second and you calculate you just put this this just put this uh, uh, number here and uh, you get the number of photon from the luminosity of the star the total amount of radiation that is coming out of the star divided by 4 pi r square divided by the momentum of the photon and the c so this will give you the average energy of the photon and you divide by it, that will give you the number of photons that is going to uh, fight with the number of electrons so when there is two body interaction you need the number of electrons uh, number density of electron number density of photon so you already know the number density of electron from the density of the gas and you already know the number of photon from the luminosity of the star okay so this is the numbers you put one inside the other and that is the force that that the electrons feel due to the collision of the by the photons okay so the photons are hitting the electrons and this is the force that the electrons are going to feel and we want to equate them so we want to equate these two forces one is gravity and one is this force due to electrons so concept is that gravity is pulling the electron or uh, protons and the radiation is pushing the electron you just equate these two so these are the two forces as soon as you equate it you get a you get a luminosity that uh, equal to this Which has you can see that the only the constants are there. Mass of the proton is there. Uh, gravitational constant is the mass of the star, central object. This is the interaction cross section. This is the luminosity. So if the if the star has luminosity L sub e, then they, uh, then that must be that limited by this. If the star is large, has more luminosity, then the electrons will be pushed out. Matter will no longer be active. Matter will be said no 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 you cannot come in because uh, electrons are being pushed out. So they will also carry protons with them. See, there are Coulomb coupling, coupling is there. So on an average, electrons cannot run away without taking the protons. Just like protons cannot fall in without taking the electrons, because they are all Coulomb coupled. Okay. So here also, you push the electrons, but then they, due to Coulomb coupling, protons will also start going out. So there will be outflow or winds rather than attraction. So if your luminosity is larger than that, there will be outflow. If it is less than that, you are allowed to fall. Okay. Now, if you allow, if you divide by the velocity of light square, that will give you a rate gram per second. So, how many grams per second is allowed onto a star depends on basically is really this number. Okay. And as you can see that this number depends on the mass of the black hole only. Protons are these are all constant number, constants. Okay. So, mass of the central object decides that what is the uh, electron, what is the rate, 
highest possible rate by which it is allowed to fall in. Okay. Now, if it is less than that, no big deal. Okay, they will fall in good. But if it is larger than that, rejection immediately will be so high that it will push the matter, it will cause an outflow. Okay. This is a very important concept. I think you put these numbers into a, a right the equation, put these numbers so that you know exactly what the number we are talking about. You always we talk about in terms of Eddington movement, we call it E means Eddington, Eddington luminosity, Eddington rate. Okay. So this is a very important concept, although this is not exactly valid for black holes. Why? Because black hole has no hard surface. Black hole is not going to emit radiation uh, and which is going to stop the matter. Okay. So it is some kind of um, paradoxical, but still roughly it works. Why? Because black hole may not be emitting anything, but the matter which is falling onto the black hole themselves are emitting and they will stop new matter to follow. Okay. So there is a limit also, but don't also lim the limit is a little bit larger. Why? Because black holes usually eat a lot of matter anyway, and that even the radiation that is the matter is going to emit, part of the radiation is also eaten by the black hole. So end of the day, you may have to send 16 times more matter in order to produce a rectal luminosity. Why? Because black hole is 6% efficient. So I'll come to that. But for a normal star, this is a good number. Okay, this is about 10 to the power 18 lumps per second, and this mass is not sufficient such that when the disk is filled up with this matter, that the gravity becomes important. So this is filled up with matter, but the gravity of the disk is not strong. So the entire science that we are going to discuss can be discussed assuming the central object is the only source of gravity, and not the disk around it. Why? Because the entire disk is acting matter very slowly, 10 to the power 18 grams per second, whereas the mass of the star sitting there may be 10 to the power 34 grams. Okay. So it will take 10 to the power 16 seconds of accretion, which is a large number, per day 10 to the power 5 seconds, per year 10 to the power 7 seconds, and 10 to the power 16 seconds means 1 billion years. So it will take a billion years at that rate if the matter falls in to increase the mass of the central object by factor of Okay. So if you want to increase the mass of the central object at this rate, it, it will take a long time. So don't, so you can ignore the mass of the disk, although matter is falling in, radiation is coming out, but it is not changing the mass of the central object very rapidly. That is one of the reasons we don't usually assume that the mass is changing very rapidly. Okay, We assume that mass is constant, central object. Why? Because of this number. Rate is very slow. The rate is not much. And that is why the disk is very light. This is not self gravity, so it is not the gravity is not strong compared to the gravity of the central object. So central object's mass can be assumed to be constant during the in our lifetime or the lifetime of the satellite, and at least definitely true. Okay. So these are the definitely this is a very interesting concept that you should know. The next one again very important is mass function. Okay. Many of you may have read it, many of you may not have read it, but mass function is very important. In astronomy, you know, objects are very far away, and so you have to, to find clever ways to find out the mass, distance, and their properties. Okay, because only a few photons come to you, and you have to be like a detective to be able to reconstruct what must be happening there. Okay, you really have not much, not many instruments to to understand uh, what the objects are. So the mass function is one of the things by which you can get some idea about what are the masses of those objects. Okay. So let me tell you what the mass function is, very simply. Again, so I am first lecture, so I am just giving you all the basic tools that you must require to understand the rest of the lectures. Mass function, imagine that there are two stars, again, central mass is here, and their distance is A, A1 plus A2. So there is A1, A2, central mass, the total area is A. So this A1, everyone knows that A1, A1 equal to A2, you have read it. And, uh, and then one, one interesting thing, the binary system need not be like that or need not be like that. You are not in a special position in the universe. You are in a generic position on Earth. Okay? So the, you don't expect that everybody is doing like that or everybody is doing like that. So you expect that everybody or the binaries have some kind of angle I with respect to the line of sight. Okay? So you are pointing at the center of mass and there is a local normal which is telling you about the angular momentum vector of the system. And that angle okay, is I need not be 0 or 90 degree. Okay? So this needs to be a, an angle I. And therefore, the velocity that you measure by Doppler shift need not be the, 
velocity like that that I have plotted here, but it is really if you are measuring the projection, projected velocity. Okay, projected velocity only you are measuring. <coughs> okay, if the system is like that, then the velocity is not changing at all. If the system is like that, then the velocity is changing highest. But normally there is an angle i. So you are by Doppler shift you are measuring only the projected velocity, and that is the a complication, the complication in the system. So this is the velocity that you are measuring, not 2 pi by 2 pi by p into a, a1, but into a1 sine i. It's a projected velocity. And then you apply this into your Doppler, into your Kepler's law. So in Kepler's law, don't use v5 as though it is you are looking like this, a1. So typically it is not a1 or n1. It is a normal, it is a generic direction. So just apply this and then you find that this is a function I think you should derive that is very simple derivation. Okay. And then you find that there is a that you can combine mass one, mass two and the inclination angle on one side and the other side is the period and the velocity that you measure. Okay. Velocity V1, not you measure but the velocity V1 of the system. So this is the this is V1 that you measure at velocity is really the projected velocity. So the, this side are the observed quantities. Period you measure from the elliptical, let us say eclipsing binary, you know the period. There are many other ways to compute the period, and you also know the velocity from the Doppler shift. So these are the observables, and these are the non observables. Okay? So left hand side is something you want to know, and right hand side are the things which you actually measure by your instrument. Okay? So observers measure the right hand side, and they try to infer from the left, about the left hand side. Left hand side, there are three unknowns m1, m2, and i. So from one equation, you cannot get three unknown. That is impossible. So all you can do is you can apply some ingenuity. For instance, sine i is always less than one. That says something. And you can have a system where m1 is very, very small compared to m2. You can ignore m1. So ultimately, left hand side becomes m2 sine q i. This is, by the way, is mass function. Okay. So this becomes m2 sine q i is same as the this term, this part you know, this part you know from the measurement. So this part is m2 sine q i, but sine q i is very, very low compared to 1, okay, because sine i is less than 1. So, so all you have is that this number, suppose this number is 20 or 10 from observation, and this side it says m2 sine q i is same as 10. So this is this gives you some idea about the system. So the, the, we are having m2 sine q i equal to let us say 10. Okay. Since this is very very less compared to 1, this must be very very large compared to 10. Okay. So that directly tells you that mass at least one if m1 is very very small compared to m2, and then we have this m2 must be very very large compared to the observed mass function. Large. So you know that it is it could be a black hole. It is larger than 3, 4, 5, you know that already, even with sine qi, if it is already larger than 3, you know the object has to be a black hole. Because this is less than 1, it goes up on this side, it becomes even larger than 3. Okay. So inclination, even if you don't know the inclination angle exactly, you, have, you will know some indirect way, yes, that's a black hole because the mass is very large uh, and the size is compact, you don't see it. In optical, but there is a center of mass which is going around. So this mass function you need to derive and try to put it in your mind because we use that mass function very often to, you know, it is an extra base, extra sort of um, uh, additional cross check that the way that we are dealing with a black hole or not. Okay. So now the, the I will go to very simple a few slides before we go into the science part. How do you know that black holes exist? As I said, the black holes don't um, show up themselves. They don't. They, there is nothing. They don't emit anything. Okay, but the, the matter which is falling around the black hole is emitting. That you have already got the idea. Now this matter, you can also calculate the velocity by which it is rotating. You will be surprised. The velocity will be almost velocity of light if it is closer to the black hole. Okay. Let us say in this region it is around three. 0.3 times velocity of light, 30 percent. Now, if the matter is rotating like this, there is a Doppler effect. It is coming towards you, so the flow is brighter, 
So is blue shifted. Why it is I'm saying blue shifted? Is the yellow color is the blue shifted part of the red? Okay. You can see that. On that side is going away from the black hole. You can see that this is pain and this is red shifted. Means the frequency has gone down. So the even by seeing the picture, I know that the matter is rotating like this. Why? Because it is blue shifted brighter, they shifted fainter. Okay. Then black hole itself is not remaining anything. So that part is uh, done. The other side of the disk, because the photon is bent like that, other side of the disk you will not see flat. You will see it is like bent like this. Okay. When the photons come to you after a bent root, and then your eye cannot follow that bent root, so clearly you see that part what the disk. Okay. So then the acquisition disk you so far you know that it is a it is a circular. You have been hoping that you will see some circular disk here, but you are disappointed. Because you, you don't see it circular, you see something like that. Okay? Why? Because this part is, you know, the photon is coming towards you and the black hole is attracting them. So you see from sideways, black hole is attracting like that to you. From that side it is straight, from this side, acquisition disk, photon is bent like that. But your eye cannot follow this. Your eye follows only straight lines. Okay? So this part apparently bends out. This part will be what? So the other side of the black hole, the attrition disk will not look like a flat disk, it will be bent and come up like that. In reality, it is sitting there, but the photon has bent. Okay, but you are not following the path of the photon. You are assuming that the photon is <coughs> on that side, so the disk must be straight. So that is what happens to a straight disk, it has it gets warped. So that is one of the things which people are trying to search, even, uh, even horizon telescope, people are trying to find out the uh, black holes. The sites I already mentioned. Only three kilometers in radius if the mass is ten solar mass. Oh, sorry, one solar mass. If it is ten solar mass black hole, ten times more, it will be thirty kilometer radius. No big deal. If it is a million solar mass black hole, like six, uh, like four million solar mass or so in our own galactic center, it will be like you know twenty million uh, kilometer in radius. Okay, so this is proportional to the mass. And uh, if you want to know the Eddington rate, again Eddington rate is proportional to mass. So for one solar mass, if it is 10 to the power 18 grams, roughly speaking, for 10 to the power 8 solar mass, it will be 10 to the power 8 times more. Instead of second, we then talk about instead for year. Because it's a 10 to the power 8 times more, you have to carry a big number. So typically, the rule of the thumb is, if it is a 10 to the power 8 solar mass black hole, it's 0.2 solar mass, 0.2 solar mass per year, or per 10 to the power 8 solar mass black hole. So if I have a 10 to the power 8 solar mass black hole, it typically eats 0.2 solar mass matter per year. So that is the heating rate. So you know that you have to supply <coughs> supply a star. For example, if you are getting from a, at an heating rate, you have to supply a star of 0.2 solar mass every year. Okay, just go on feeding it a black hole, a star, which is five times smaller compared to the sun. So it is eating per year. And once you give it, for one year it is happy. On an average every year you have to supply one supply <coughs> if the mass of the black hole is 10 to the power 8 solar mass. Okay? 100 million. Or typically we know the black holes to be even more massive, like 6 billion solar masses, M87, or in our own galactic center only 4 million solar masses. It's not a big number, but still sufficient. Okay. So that is if you have, if you could take the photograph of a black hole, you would see like but your camera is not high resolution, independent of what high tech camera you are carrying. Nobody can take a picture here like that in the case of small black holes, but in the case of supermassive black holes, the distance is sufficiently large, as, I, as you know that is proportional to the size of the black hole. It could be even the size of the black hole could be size larger than the size of the solar system. I think you should calculate that if I have a black hole of M87, 6 billion solar mass, what would be the size of the black hole horizon, that black part? Size of your uh, solar system. So black holes not necessarily like small object. Size is proportional to the mass. If the mass is high, the size is big. And this object, if it is very far away, you will have difficulty to plot, to take a picture. It's close by, like our own galactic center, smaller mass, but still people are hoping that if people will be able to see this hole, this blackness. Okay, this black part. Okay, this black part will be definite signature. Yes, space time is there. End of the space time. At least we don't see what is going on inside. So that is something everybody likes to know. It's a million dollar question, and people are there, a large number of teams working on it. 
The other thing that you see from the whole systems, this is just some examples. I'm going to a little bit, not getting into the science yet. This is just the basic thing. When matter is falling onto a black hole, you would expect that it will eat up everything. The answer is that it is not true. It is becoming hot. Hot means it will be puffed up. And some of the matter will say, I don't like, I, I don't have to go to black hole. Black hole is pulling me all right, but I have sufficient pressure to get out of the system. Okay. So in other words, when the matter is falling in, it is not necessary that entire set of matter will be going to the black hole. Part of it will be so hot that it will get out of the system in a perpendicular direction. Okay. We see them every day. These are called jets, cosmic radio jets, because they have been originally discovered by the radio. And we also see them for small black holes, we see them for massive black holes. Then the question comes that what is a, why do you know that they are coming from black holes? Well, these objects are very exciting objects. You can see this M87 that I have been telling you about. <coughs> this object is emitting this thing for hundreds of millions of years in the same direction, with the same velocity. In other words, and the direction, if you know today, if you have a high resolution camera, radio, radio people have, they are emitting today in the same direction that it was emitting 100 million years ago. So there is a space time itself is non isotropic. That direction must have a specialty which 100 million years it is respecting. Matter is coming out and coming out in that direction only. And somebody is supplying energy to that. So that is an indirect evidence, observational evidence. And it's circumstantial evidence rather that it is a black hole. Because other than that, nobody would attract matter, fool them, uh, fool them to come here, and then push them out and in the same direction in the, along the axis. So that really we assume that this is the axis of the black hole in which matter is getting pushed out for millions of years. Okay. And sometimes you know this matter can be almost with velocity of light. So they're not only being pushed out, they are pushed out very rapidly and they are being constantly supplied. Why? Because their radio emission is such that if you did not supply, it would have been pulled down long time ago. The fact that they are not pulling down means somebody is supplying energy all the time. Okay? So this is a, a circumstantial evidence that somebody is sitting there at the galactic center who is getting huge amount of matter, part of it is pushed out, and we have to see them. And again, you can see, that you may ask, that what is the other component? There are two, both sides should come out. Okay, this side you see bright because it is coming towards you, so the Doppler signal is brighter. The other one is going away from you, even if it is emitted, it is very faint. So this tells you that they are also relatively still. Okay, so these are the circumstantial evidence. I already told you about the rotation around this object and the velocity and the mass of the object coming from the same object. The plus law gives you a huge mass. So this is also an evidence. This is another example of the jet. You can see that one component is bright, one component is faint. One is one has a projected velocity towards you. See, then you should always think of yourself like this. Earth is a very generic planet around a generic star, around a, in a generic satellite, in a galaxy. We are not special. So when you see something, you never assume that you are sitting at a special point. You are in a generic point. Given that, that the jets which are coming out need not be coming out like that only, all of them, or need not come out like that only. If you had been like that, you would see both the components equally bright. Statistically, all of them will have some component towards you and some component away from you. Okay? They, very rarely, both of them are equal bright. Or very rarely, you see only one of them or coming directly towards you. Okay? These are called blazers. And these will be, I don't know the special name, but there could be some objects. But most of the cases, there is a component towards you, and that means it will be Doppler shifted, it will be brighter component, and the one that is going away from you will be painter. So <coughs> this is a generic, this is, an, uh, this is a jet hitting the atmosphere uh, in the ambient medium, dissipating it, and the way it is dissipating is huge amount of radiation, about 10 to the power 44 to 10 to the power 48 hours per second. You imagine, com compared to this, compare this with the radiation that the sun is emitting. Sun is emitting 4 into 10 to the power 33 hours per second. Okay? These fellows, just this stupid gas, is emitting 10 to the power 48 hours per second. Huge, maybe 10 to the power 15 times more. Or even if it is 10 to the power 4, it will be like 10 to the power 11 times, you know, 1,000 billion times more compared to the sun. So it's a huge amount of energy is emitted. Who is supplying it? This, it is coming directly from the jet. And jet means it's coming from accretion, 
as part of his created image. So these objects are seen, and people know that these are the indirect evidences that black holes exist. I will not come to the jet and the other things. My 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 concentration will be to try to understand how the matter is falling in, because that itself is a huge subject, and I will not be able to finish even within a few hours. Now, just wanted to uh, give you one more example. Uh, the same jet, M87. If you go to higher and higher resolution, you can see that the uh, wavelength of the radiation, that uh, it's, uh, the, the, you know, the radio wave that is used, people use higher and higher frequency to see smaller and smaller sizes. They go to higher and higher frequencies, and you see the you get zoom. You, you, you see the zoom effect. Okay? You see the, the zoom part of the jet. Okay, you go to Mm, and the zoom part, and you find that even when you zoom it, it is going in the same direction. That is what I was mentioning, that it knows exactly which direction to go, even from the part. In other words, the process of forming them remains identical, last 100 million years or so, or even more. Okay. So this is a somebody sitting there, we believe it's a black hole, and presumably it is a persisting black hole, rotating black hole. Okay. Now, so I will come to this, I will rest of my uh, talks, even today also I have maybe a few minutes just to uh, talk about the very basic uh, you know, dimensions and other things and then maybe we will start the next talk will be substantial the radial motion and rotation motion I think we will start. Okay, so in astrophysics we always talk about the length scales and time scales and the uh, typical things, you know, uh, dimensions and units in which things, things go. Okay. In a black hole I already told you, it's a small black hole, size is 3 kilometers, so one solar mass, typically one solar mass black holes don't exist. Typically black hole mass is larger than three solar mass. So about 10 kilometers. So anything that is happening around the black hole, smallest possible size you can expect is 10 kilometers. Okay. Nothing is happening less than a 10 kilometer length scale. So that is this length scale will be like the size of the horizon itself, R sub G. Okay. So this is about 10 to the power 5, it is written that 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 5 means 3 kilometers in centimeter you can see mass of the black hole by mass of the sun okay so for one solar mass three kilometer so you can assume that nothing is going on in a smaller scale than that that is the smallest scale size of the black hole so what is the time scale of variability so if something happens and it changes with time it cannot be faster than the light crossing time of the horizon horizon is very small three kilometers and light takes 10 to the power minus five seconds to cross it okay so you should not expect anything going faster than 10 microseconds Typically. So that is that gives you an idea that the time things are changing even at 10 microsecond interval. That you may be, you may be surprised or you may say, oh, not nano, <coughs> no, but not nano. 10 microsecond is good enough. So even the satellites are having a hard time to get photons within that time uh, frame. Because you need to have, if you want to see the time variation, you need to save the, save photons within that time frame. So 10 microsecond, you must save every 10 microsecond. And how many photons you are going to get? If black hole is very far away, the satellite is this little, and then how many photons will come to you per second? So, and then you need to know the timing, how fast they are, so you need to be able to save every 10 microsecond, let us say. You may not get even a stupid photon in that time. So you may not be able to be, you have to say, okay, I will integrate it up to point one second and see how many photons. Or you make the satellite much bigger. So this is, these are the concerns of the observers or the people on instrumentation. They always talk to the theories that or what kind of satellite I'm going to make, tell me to be able to see that object when it is very faint. So that tells you, yes, you must have at least this big satellite, otherwise you will not get a stupid photon in 10 microseconds. So that is our goal. This uh, spe uh, specific angular momentum is R, R is the length scale, C is the velocity of light. So this will be the typical amount of angular momentum that matter has. Okay? It is good to calculate all these numbers for your own sake, it will be nice. Accretion rate I already discussed, so not getting into detail. About 10 to the power 17 grams per one solar mass. If it is a 10 solar mass, 10 to the power 18 grams per second. Okay? If it is a 10 to the power 8 solar mass, about 0.2 solar mass per year. Because it's a bigger black hole, we instead of second we measure in terms of year. No big thing. Luminosity I already discussed, and uh, density of gas, you can always find the dimension of density out of the Eddington rate and the time and the length or length volume. Volume is the volume of the black hole. This is smallest length scale, so R D cube is the smallest volume scale. Okay, so that tells you the typical amount of density. This is the gram, 10 to the minus 5 gram per cc. It's not a bad number, everyday number. 
Okay. So black holes doesn't mean that they are highly exotic systems. In fact, average value density of a black hole, a large black hole, could be larger than a uh, what? Okay. Average density could be very large. So you try to calculate the average density right here. Calculate it. Increase the mass, you can see that the A, that you will be able to see that the average density could be much larger. Real temperature is coming out um, to be just taking mass of proton and convert it into energy. It will become real temperature, 10 to the power, say, in this event, this is about 12, 10 to the power, 12 Kelvin. So typically, you expect things to become that hot, close to a black hole, 10 to the power 12. In reality, it is not that hot. It starts emitting, it equalizes, share the energy, start radiating. It is never larger than 10 to the power 9 or 10 to the power 10 degrees. That's a big number. Compared to the temper temperature at the center of the sun, where nuclear reaction is going on, 10 to the power 7. At the center of the sun, temperature 7. Around the black hole, when matter is coming in, it could be as high as 10 to the power 12, <coughs> theoretically, but in reality, about 10 to the power 10. Okay, that's a big number also. Black body temperature, if the radiation were coming out in black body, namely, if matter interacted with the radiation for a long, long time, so that the maximum Boltzmann distribution of the electrons, which which decide which is dictated by the temperature of the electrons, is totally uh, comes into the photons also. Photon also has the same temperature. Then we we'll call it a black body emission. Okay. So you have, if you have a number of electrons and the photon is trapped, and the photon is interacting so many times that it has basically sampled all the velocity distribution of the Boltzmann distribution then it basically has the information about the temperature of the gas, and that becomes thermal photon distribution, that's black body distribution, and that is the temperature, okay? Photons don't have to interact so many times when matter is falling on the black hole, because by the time it is interacting, matter is already gone. So maybe after a few interactions, matter is already gone, so distribution doesn't have to be a black body. But if there is a place where they are happily interacting for a long, long time, we call it optical thick region, you do will produce a, Black body radiation for you. Okay. And black body temperature, it will be thermal radiation. Temperature of the black body radiation will be same as the temper temperature of the maximum Boltzmann distribution. Okay. So th that is the only way to say that this is a thermal radiation and they, they, they interact sufficiently to be able to sample all kinds of velocities of the electrons. Then there are magnetic fields. You can equate the magnetic energy with this uh, potential energy just outside the horizon. You get a magnetic field of about 10 to the power 8 gauss and to the power m black hole to the power minus half. Okay. So if the black hole is 10 to the power 8 solar mass, it is 10 to the power 4 gauss. So typically the field that can be that can be kept there about 10 to the power 8 gauss per one solar mass object. Okay. Very <coughs> strong field, 10 to the power <coughs> Tesla. Property per massive eh? Okay. So I don't know whether I should continue today. This is 9 o'clock, it's already one and a half hours. So no, no, but so I keep on going, I have no problem. Can you ask like in another section or what? No, no, I have infinite number of slides. I mean, I, don't, I, I have no reason to stop. <laughs> but we, we, we should stop it. Eh, that, that is precisely what we have. 10.30, we should stop. Yeah. Okay, 10.30. You do. Or some minutes early, that's fine. Okay, so now I want to say something which is exciting. Okay, this is very fundamental. You take a Newtonian star and you want to fall onto this star, a Newtonian point like object, very exciting thing, okay. I'm just telling it exciting so that you don't go to sleep. No, this is really exciting. In fact, this should be first time probably you will hear me here. This is the, it is a Newtonian object, this is zero, this is R, you agree? And the object is falling onto a star with the potential is uh, one over R, and this the force is like that, 1 over r square, okay? And a matter is falling, rotating also, centrifugal force. So this is, let, let me put the force here, okay? 1 over r square. It is falling. It's minus sign, and this is the potential, V, or phi. And the centrifugal force will go like L square by r. I already discussed this, okay? So matter is coming, rotating, and coming towards a Newtonian object. How do you know it is Newtonian? Because potential I have chosen to be Newtonian force. Okay? So if I sum these two forces, the force it will it will look like this. Do you agree? Because this is going like one over R cube. So this will always blow off 
compared to 1 over r squared as r goes to 0. You agree? So if the effective potential of this is the force rather, I could have plotted potential, would have been thicker. I can do this. That then I can talk about potential, you take the gradient, it will be <coughs> But people usually talk about potential as well as forces, so let us stick to this. So this is one of our potential going deeper and deeper, no big deal. But then the matter cannot come close to the r equal to zero. Why? Because centrifugal force is stopping it to go. Centrifugal energy, half d phi square, which is L square by r square, is blowing off much faster compared to potential. So if a particle is coming from infinity, it will be bounced back and go back to infinity. It cannot touch r equal to zero, independent of how much, how little angular momentum you have. So this is very exciting point. Even if you have a non-zero small amount of angular momentum, the centrifugal term will become larger and larger and block your entrance and it will send you back to infinity. Okay, because the barrier is going like that. Okay. Now I request you to do the same problem with this kind of potential. Okay. If you do that, okay, so then you do the uh, similar analysis. Calculate the effective potential. So, so the effective potential so far in an Newtonian star, I was choosing to be minus one over r by half a square by two r square. This was I was using. Okay, potential and the kinetic refine. Now I am trying to say that choose this. I call it pseudo Newtonian. Lot of people took this scan. We have talked about it long time ago. It's very similar to what happens. Close to the black hole for the time being, this is good enough. So choose this. Okay. What you will find is that you will find that if you plot it and if you add them up and so on, you will find yes, this this 1 over r minus 2 is also going like that. Centrifugal part is also going like that. But if you add them up, okay add them up, you will find that this one goes like that. Okay. This is exciting. This is the most exciting part I was telling you. So black hole will always attract everybody, independent of what angular momentum you have. If you have angular momentum zero, no big deal. You are getting into a black hole state. Okay. If you have angular momentum a little bit non-zero, it will try to stop it, but then ultimately this, it will fall. Really, just calculate this in, in the in the after this lecture. You try to plot this. So as you increase the angular momentum, there is a there is a minimum angular momentum, this value, we call it marginally stable angular momentum. Up to that angular momentum, black hole doesn't even care. You can have that angular momentum about 3.4 in the unit of gm by c cube, a uh, gm by c, and matter black hole will not even care. So Newtonian objects were carrying even if having in the small black hole, uh, angular momentum. But black holes up to this, when this maximum and minimum are actually march into a point of inflection, up to that angular momentum, black holes don't even give you any problem. You get in. If you have a little bit larger angular momentum, black hole will say, okay, hang on, you stay right there in the minimum. That is your Kepler in orbit. Stay there. If you have a larger energy, okay. You can have an angular momentum such that it touches this rest mass again and comes back. It's <coughs> called marginally bound orbit. I will come to this again. And then, but the beauty is, if the angular momentum is very large, let it be so. It again comes back. But what it means is that if your energy is low, you again go back to infinity. Black hole is not that generous. But if you're if you're sending with a machine gun, if you're like a bullet you are sending, or your hot gas, you can always go over this potential barrier and get into the black hole. So in the Newtonian case is you know, unforgiving. If there is a small angular momentum, it is always infinite. Of course, the Newtonian object is not so compact. I will come to that. There is a caveat into all these things. It is not so dramatic. But I am trying to make it dramatic because you actually see the difference. Then we will come to the realistic thing. In Newtonian case, it will go to infinity, and they will turn you back. In the case of the general relativity, in the case of black holes, if you have low energy, low angular momentum, no big deal. 
if you have a high angular momentum also, you can still cross it if your energy is higher. So this is your energy at infinity, this is your energy, this is your, uh, let us say, R, and this is the pot efficiency potential V, okay? And you give some energy to it by making it a hot gas or by sending a bullet, like a machine gun with a velocity non zero at infinity, you have a positive energy, it will cross the barrier if we enter into that. So there's a huge difference between the black hole accretion and the accretion of the Newtonian object. Secondly, if you take the minimum, so take the potential, take a phi prime, take double phi prime, put them to zero, you will get point of inflection. So phi prime equal to zero, phi double prime equal to zero, calculate it. At what angular momentum, you will have point of inflection. At what radius this inflection takes place? This is called marginal, you will find that this is called marginally stable angular momentum. This radius will be 6 gm by c square, three times the height of the black hole. And if you collect all the minima, if you connect them all the minima and connect all the maxima, you know what you are getting? You are taking the locus of all phi prime equal to zero. And phi prime equal to zero is for what? What happens? It's for Keplerian orbit. Okay, so Kepler's orbit is obtained by phi prime equal to zero, and that will give you that curve that I drew ordinarily. So that curve that I drew does not look like the Newtonian. Okay, uh, Newtonian is square root of r. This is square root of r divided by one minus two by r. I have already plotted long time ago, but now you know where it came from. It came from phi prime of this equation. This is the phi prime. This is the locus of all the minima and all the maxima of this curve, okay? And this point is called marginally stable radius, 6 gm by c square for short black hole. And this radius, this angular momentum, is the minimum angular momentum you need in order to fill some obstacle. If your angular momentum is less than that, black hole doesn't even care, okay? If your angular momentum is larger than that, then black hole will say, okay, slow down you hang around in your orbit until I reduce your angular momentum. Okay, so these objects, given chance, and no collision among them, all the objects would like to, like to be in that orbit, like Saturn's ring. Okay. They will be sitting in Kepler's orbit, no, not colliding among themselves. That will be very stupid things. Okay, that is not activating, and they, whatever energy they have, they will just radiate, and then ultimately you will not see anything. But you want matter to be accreted, you want them to be colliding, and for that purpose, you want matter to come from here to there. By the time the matter comes from here to there, you must be able to lose this amount of angular momentum. Okay. And how do you lose angular momentum? You must apply a torque. Okay. Angular momentum is momentum momentum. So you have to be able to lose momentum, and that is done by viscosity. So flow must have significant viscosity in order that matter when it comes from here to there, because you want it to be accreted. So this matter does not want to be accreted, unless you reduce the angular momentum. But angular momentum reduction is done by viscosity, because you want to reduce the momentum. So every time the matter you want to put in, goes come closer and closer to the black hole, it will go delta r, it will lose delta l, again delta r, delta l, delta r, delta l, you have to go on losing it through viscosity. If you don't have viscosity, sorry, you cannot get it. Okay. So otherwise, then you will have to go on rotating like Newton's, uh, you know, uh, Saturn's ring. It will not emit much. Okay. So I think that this is the end of the discussion to today. We can continue from here next time, whenever it is. Tomorrow. No, you have another slot. Hey, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, let's have a break. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to have a break. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but. <laughs>